for me to introduce the two men who will speak to us in this hour, Samuel Hazo and Dana Joya. And since we have only an hour with them, I'll keep the introduction short. In fact, I'll be most efficient if I say up front they have much in common. Both have been state poets laureate, Sam Hazo for Pennsylvania and Dana Joya for California. Both are prolific authors, having published many collections of poems and essays. Both have won awards and received honorary doctorates beyond counting. Both have enriched the art, the art of poetry not only through their practice, but also through their patronage and promotion. Dana Joya served as chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts from 2003 through 2009. Samuel Hazo was founder and director of the International Poetry Forum based in Pittsburgh and Washington, D.C. for more than four decades. Joya and Hazo also share a reputation for broad-mindedness and generosity. Recently, um, uh, Michael Deirda in the Washington Post referred to Dana as Maoist in his tendency to let a thousand flowers bloom. I love that. And you could say it about Sam also. Though both are artists of firm aesthetic principle, they recognize and encourage excellence all along the spectrum of poetic styles and schools. They are, in this sense, and in many others, truly Catholic. They have known each other for many years and have encouraged each other's work. When I was called upon to write a feature story on Sam Hazo, I interviewed Dana Joya. When I was assigned to write a feature on Dana, I interviewed Sam. <laughs> I cannot think of anything I'd rather do than listen to these two poets together, so I'll shut up now. Dana Joya. When critics and scholars talk about Catholic literature, they almost inevitably begin talking about novels and movies. Uh, because these are the great sociological forms, you know, which uh, portray the detail of daily existence. Uh, they can look at a novel of uh, Ron Hansen's about a convent, and they can correctly identify it as Catholic. Uh, <laughs> they can read J.F. Yeah, Powers' stories about priests, uh, Martin Scorsese's films about sin-obsessed uh, lowlifes, Flannery O'Connor's about, you know, Bible intoxicated eccentrics, and it, it's an easy entree in terms of talking about it in a religious context. But this is actually a very Anglo-American perspective. In most of the world, Catholic literature is primarily poetry. Think of you know Italian with Dante, you know Saint Francis of Assisi, Torquato Tasso. Think of Spanish with Lope de Vega, Saint John of the Cross, uh, or in the New World with Sor Juana. You know French with Paul Claudel, Charles Peguy, the, the Latin uh, tradition with poets uh, as obscure as Thomas Aquinas. You know the Austrian German tradition with Hugo von Hofmannsthal. Now, since poetry is primarily a lyric art. Uh, it is often harder to see the external Catholic subject matter. The Catholicism is mostly reflected in the worldview. Catholic poets participate in the mysteries of faith. Uh, the poetry tends to be incarnational, sacramental, redemptive, and it works naturally by showing the relationships and the disjunction between the physical and the metaphysical, the temporal, and the eternal realms of existence. And in that breath of sort of Catholic poetry, I'm going to read you six poems, five of them short, one of them sort of middle length. I thought I would begin with a prayer. Um, I was, much to my mother's consternation, born a month early on Christmas Eve. And so she missed all of her maternity leave, you know, back in those, those days. And I've always been conscious of the relationship between the winter solstice 
and Christmas. This is called Prayer at Winter Solstice. Blessed is the road that keeps us homeless. Blessed is the mountain that blocks our way. Blessed are hunger and thirst, loneliness and all forms of desire. Blessed is the labor that exhausts us without end. Blessed are the night and darkness that blind us. Blessed is the cold that teaches us to feel. Blessed are the cat, the child, the cricket, and the crow. Blessed is the hawk devouring the hare. Blessed are the sinner and the saint who redeem each other. Blessed are the dead, perfect, uh, excuse me, calm in their perfection. Blessed is the pain that humbles us. Blessed is the distance that bars our joy. Blessed is this shortest day, which makes us long for light. Blessed is the love that in losing we discover. Uh, I'd now like to, to read a poem which is oddly one of the two poems I have in the Oxford uh, Ameri in a Book of American Verse. I would never have predicted that it would end up there. In fact, I didn't think anybody would like it. Uh, it is, I will say without any contra fear of contradiction, it is the best uh, dactylic, allegorical, religious ballad you are likely to hear this year. Uh, it describes a corrupt medieval archbishop. The archbishop. Oh, do not disturb the archbishop asleep in his ivory chair. You must send all the workers away, though the church is in need of repair. The archbishop is tired from preaching to the halt and the lame and the blind. Their spiritual needs are unsubtle. Their notions of God unrefined. The Lord watched the feet of his servants, the first shall be last, he advised. The Archbishop's edition of Matthew has this troublesome text revised. The Archbishop declines to wear glasses, so his sense of the world grows dim. He thinks that the crowds at the masses have gathered in honor of him. In the crypt of the limestone cathedral, a friar recopies St. Mark. A nun makes stew with a novice. A choir boy sobs in the dark. While high in the chancery office, his reverence studies the glass, wondering which of his vestments would look best at Palm Sunday Mass. The saints in their weather-stained niches weep as the vespers are read, and the beggars sleep on the church steps and the orphans retire unfed. On Easter, the Lord is arisen, while the archbishop breakfasts in bed, and the humble shall find resurrection, and the dead shall lie down with the dead. Um, I'm half Italian, half uh, Mexican, and I grew up with something that is uh, anybody in the Southwest knows, which are santos, you know, which are images of saints that people have in their in their homes, and uh, most of these were carved in wood by uh, anonymous folk artists, and a lot of them have ended up now, you know, 200 years later in museums uh, as anonymous works of art. And this is a poem spoken by one of these santos, a statue of an, an angel which has been damaged in the Mexican Revolution, uh, which is uh, Richard Rodriguez reminded us yesterday, Catholicism was made illegal, the, the, and the churches were vandalized, and all, the religious images destroyed. Uh, this one has survived and is now in a museum, and it's speaking 
to the audience. And this is about, in some ways, how so much of the art we see was intended to be sacred, but it's been now put into museums where we look on it as an aesthetic object. The angel with the broken wing. I am the angel with the broken wing, the one large statue in this quiet room. The staff finds me too fierce. And so they shut Faith's ardor in this air-conditioned tomb. The docents praise my elegant design above the chatter of the gallery. Perhaps I am a masterpiece of sorts, the perfect emblem of futility. Mendoza carved me for a country church. His name's forgotten now, except by me. I stood beside the gilded altar where the hopeless offered God their misery. I heard their women whispering at my feet, prayers for the lost, the dying, and the dead. Their candles stretched my shadow up the wall, and I became the hunger that they fed. I lost my left wing in the revolution. Even a saint can savor irony. When troops were sent to vandalize the chapel. They hit me once, almost apologetically, for even the godless feel something in a church, a twinge of hope, fear, who knows what it is, a trembling unaccounted by their laws, an ancient memory that they can't dismiss. There is so much I must tell God the howling of the damned can't reach that high, but I stand here like a dead thing nailed to a perch, a crippled saint against a painted sky. Now I'm gonna read a poem that's entirely true. Um, it needs a tiny bit of a preface. Um, when I was 11, um, I was visiting my Mexican grandfather, and he was a hard and hard-drinking man who didn't really have much use for his grandkids, uh, me in particular, who was bookish. And we found ourselves alone, which almost never happened, and he looked at me and said, how old are you? And I told him, you know, I was you know, 11, about to be 12, and he told me, well, I left school when I was your age. And I knew that. I knew that both of my grandfathers had only gone to fourth grade. But what I didn't know was what came next. And so I had to make conversation. So I said, well, why did you leave school? And he said, well, when my father got shot and killed in a bar, uh, my brother and I had to become cowboys to support the family. And that I didn't know. Um, and so I talked to him, and I think it was the longest conversation I ever had with him. And he told me about his childhood and about being on the range. But I never knew if it was true because my grandfather was a great bullshit artist. And, uh, and so, but years later, through a series of circumstances that I won't uh, bore you with, I received a large box of documents and news clippings from turn of the century Wyoming about my grandfather's life, murder, and the subsequent manhunt and search. And I knew I had to write a poem. Um, and. I wonder if a lot of us have this thing about, I wanted to write a poem that didn't exclude the people I came from. You know, what was a poem that they, that they would have understood? Because the people I came from had no education, but they all liked poetry. And eventually, it just occurred to me that it needed to be a ballad. So this is a ballad about my great grandfather, the ballad of Jesus Ortiz. Jake's family were vaqueros. They worked the cattle drives down from Montana to market. They did what it took to survive. Jake's real name was Jesus, which the Anglos found hard to take. So after a couple of days, the cowboys called him Jake. When Jake was 12, his father brought him along to ride. Don't waste your youth in the Pueblo. Earn by your father's side. The days were long and toilsome, but all the crew got fed, and it wasn't hard to sleep on the ground when you'd never had a bed. 
Three thousand head of cattle grazing the prairie grass. Three thousand head of cattle pushed through each mountain pass. Three thousand head of cattle fording the muddy streams. And then three thousand phantoms bellowing in your dreams. At night, when the coyotes called, Jake would often weep, recalling how his mother would sing her children to sleep. But when he rose in the morning, the desert air was sweet. No sitting in a mission school with bare and dusty feet. And when the drive was over, he got his pay. And then he went back to the Pueblo, where he was one of the men. Ten years on the open range, he lived the vaquero's life, far from his home in Sonora. No children and no wife. Then Jake headed north to Wyoming to earn his winter keep among the Basques and Anglos who raised and slaughtered sheep. He came to cold, lost cabin where the rattlesnake mountains rise over the empty foothills, under the rainless skies. The herders lived in dugouts or shacks of pine and tar. The town had seven buildings. The biggest was the bar. John Oakey owned the town, the sheep king of Wyoming. He owned the herds, he owned the land, and every wild thing roaming. He hired Jake for his tavern, he let him sleep in the kitchen. Mexicans worked hard and didn't spend time bitching. Tending bar was easier than tending cattle drives. Jake poured the drinks while the men complained about their lives. Jake never asked them questions. He knew what he needed to know. Men working in the lost cabin had nowhere else to go. Jake married a sheep herder's daughter, half Indian, half white. They had two sons, and finally, things in their life were right. He told his boys his adventures as a cowboy riding the plain. Papa, they cried, will you take us when you ride out again? One night, he had an argument with a herder named Bill Howard a deserter from the border war, a drunkard and a coward. Bring over that bottle of whiskey. If you don't grab it, I will. Oki said to cut you off until you pay your bill. Bill Howard slammed his fist down. Is this some goddamn joke? Some piss poor Mexican peon telling me I'm broke? A little after midnight, Bill came back through the door. Three times he shot his rifle, and Jake fell to the floor. Then Bill beheld his triumph as the smoke cleared from the air, a mirror blown into splinters, and blood splattered everywhere. A sudden brutal outburst no motive could explain. One poor man killing another without glory, without gain. The tales of Western heroes show duels in the noonday sun, but darkness and deception is how most killings done. Father Keller came from Lander to lay Jake in the ground. A posse searched the mountains until Bill Howard was found. There were two more graves in Wyoming when the clover bloomed in the spring. Two strangers drifted into town and filled the openings. And two tall boys departed for the cattle drives that May with hardly a word to their mother who watched them right away. So I think it's important to tell the stories of people who didn't have the chance to tell their stories. Um, now, three, uh, let's see, two more poems. Um, 
My wife and I lost our first son at four months from sudden infant death syndrome. And I've written about this, but this is a poem that sort of came much later. If you've ever lost a child, you know there's a kind of phantom life the child has. You'll see a kid and you'll say, you know, a couple of years later, that's what my son would look like to him. That's what he'd be doing today. And this is about that experience. Uh, I wrote it actually in Washington, D.C. on what would have been my son's 21st birthday. And so it's called Majority. Now you'd be three, I said to myself, seeing a child born the same summer as you. Now you'd be five, or seven, or ten. I watched you grow in foreign bodies, leaping into a pool, all laughter, or frowning over a keyboard, but mostly just standing, taller each time. How splendid your most mundane actions seemed in these joyful proxies. I often held back tears. Now you are 21. Finally, it makes sense that you have gone away into your own afterlife. And uh, I'd like to end up with a poem uh, written to my wife. It seems to me that poetry do doesn't have enough ha poems about a happy marriage. You know? <laughs> now, it, maybe it's that it's just easier to write about an unhappy marriage, you know, uh, or also maybe if you have a happy marriage and you write about it too much, you know, your spouse makes it unhappy. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, but I think the, one of the real reasons is that when you're married to somebody for a long time, the two of you create a private language and it becomes really the most intimate form of communication you'll ever have with another person, but it's very fragile. Because if you lose one person, you know, through death or divorce or whatever, you have no one to speak the language with. And it reminded me of these California Indian tribes who now have only one or two native speakers. And when that person goes, the language goes, the songs go, the dances go. Marriage of many years. Most of what happens happens beyond words. The lexicon of lip and fingertip defies translation into common speech. I recognize the musk of your dark hair. It always thrills me, though I can't describe it. My finger on your thigh does not touch skin. It touches your skin. Warming to my touch, you are a language I have learned by heart. This intimate patois will vanish with us. It's only native speakers. Does it matter? Our tribal chants, our dances round the fire, performed the sorcery we most required. They bound us in a spell time could not break. Let the young flaunt their ecstasy. We keep our tribe of two in solemn secrecy. What must be lost was never lost on us. Thank you so much. Each poem I surprise from hiding is a face I learn to draw by drawing it. Master plan? None. Strategy? None. Except whatever wits I pit against myself to bring it off. Never a face imagined, nor a face in fact. My making is its own solution. It tells me how it must become, and I obey or else.
I see myself as some lost swimmer of the night who must discover where he goes by going, uncertain, dared, and curious. I stall my dive until the surface stills its saucer ditto of the moon, then plunge. Sleep's inland waves lock over me. Ashore, the sea level world of pistols, pork chops, mirrors, and garbage ripens into headlines. But where I plummet, horses ride on wings, water burns, and willows write their reasons in the wind. The pure imagination of a dream is mine to swim before the baiting light betrays me and I rise. The shore steadies where I left it. The whole unfloatable and failing world goes by as given. I swim from maybe to the merely real and make them one with words. I wonder how I did it. I wondered how I'll do it. And I've done it. I'd like to say it's a pleasure for me to appear with Dana. He's a man I've known for years, and he is the man who has the real poise of a public figure. I mean, whether it's in his profession or in the uh, honorary positions that he's been given by the government, by the state, and by the nation, he always has a superb deportment and diction and demeanor. Exemplary man. Someone once told me that poetry is traveling without a ticket. Uh, this poem is called Florence by Proxy. I was, I was prompted by a remark by Goethe. Goethe was never happy in Germany. The Germans were too industrious. He went to France, they were too cynical. He went to Switzerland, they were too sane. Finally, he went to Italy, and he said, at last, the human race. <laughs> Well, I read a comment about a year after that, and I mentioned this to Mike Aquilina. I showed him the comment. He said, he said to me, my son is going on his honeymoon to Positano, where this particular statement is engraved on a plaque. And he came back, his son came back with a picture of that plaque on which it says, al giorno del ultimo giustizio, Quando tutti andranno al paradiso, per gli amalfitani sarà un giorno come tutti gli altri. Which means, on the day of the last judgment, when everyone is going to paradise, for the people of Amalfi, it's just another day. <laughs> October's ochre changes everything to Italy. Sun-painted walls remember villas near Fiesole. I've never seen Fiesole. Someday I will, and it will seem a memory of noon in the United States when I became a Florentine because the sun bewildered me. Who among the Florentines is listening? Who else but me, who sees in the Italians the human race that Goethe saw? Today their cops are commodores, their fiats weapons and their whizzing duels on the road, their shoes and gloves, the very renaissance of calf. Tribal to the death, they swear by their mothers, breastfeed their sons wherever, prefer their pasta three-fourths cooked, and sing whatever, whenever. Mistaken for Italian half my life, I'm of the tribe. If it's Italian to speak in tears before goodbyes, I qualify. If it's Italian to choose tomatoes one by one, I qualify. <laughs> if it's Italian to laugh when no one else is laughing or to whistle at the wheel, I qualify. 
One murmur in Italian soothes the Florentine in me that French confuses, German contradicts, and Spanish misses by a hair. <laughs> One murmur, and I feel what Goethe felt when Florence wounded him with Italy for life, though Goethe spent not quite three hours there. He wrote a book af afterward called Travels to Italy. It's about the size of the Chicago telephone book. We go north and slightly west to Ireland. It's an amazing country and amazing people. You know, such a small population, and yet because of their circumstances over the centuries, they left and went to every particular place on earth. This poem is called The Real Reason for Going. It's not just to get there. Killarney's maps are for the unredeemed. The hidden land awaits the stumblers and the temporarily confused who find their destinations as they go. In Dingle, there's a history, bone final, as the faith that founded Gallerus. All that remains is what was there when Gallerus began, God, man, sheep, and stone, and stone, and stone. Dingles ago, the starvers saw their lips turn green from chewing grass before they famished in their beds. Their hovels bleach like tombs unroofed and riven by the sea. If only all the stones were beige or marble white. Their fading graves seem unforgiving as a fate that only wit or tears or immigration can defeat sheep graze over graves. Loud gulls convene on garbage dumps. In Galway, Cashel, and Trolley, I fish the air for what it is that makes the Irish Irish. Is it Seamus quoting Sweeney's prayer in Hoth and telling me of Hopkins the convert buried in Glasnevin? Is it how it sounds to sing the music in a name, Skibbereen, Balbriggan, Kilbegan, Bunratty, Listowel, Duncannon, Fairmana, and Ballyconeely? Is it Joyce's map of metaphors that makes all Dublin mythical as Greece? Is it cairns of uniambic and unrhyming rocks transformed by hand? into the perfect poem of a wall? Is it the priest near death who whispered, give my love to Roscommon and the horses of Roscommon? Is it because the Irish pray alike for Pope John Paul, our Bishop Eamon, and Ned O'Toole, late of Moy Cullen? Inside God's house or out, their sadder smiles say, the world, if given time, will break your heart. With such a creed, they should believe in nothing but the wisdom of suspicion. Instead, they say, please God, and fare ahead regardless of the odds to prove that life and God deserve at least some trust, some fearlessness, some courtesy. This is a poem about education, real education. I had a friend who's now, who was a vice president, an academic vice president. He made a great quote to me once. This was 30 years ago. College bulletins, he said, rank high in the romantic literature of our time. 
And he's correct, and it's gotten worse. Cafeteria education, online education, artificial intelligence, you know, what about natural intelligence? I make too much of it. It's a matter of books and talk and silences. But every sun I stand less sure of what I ought to know and find my way to them to find my way. Wisdom's rabbit races just far enough ahead to keep the chase invitingly close that all I really know is what occurs to me right here as right. Facing the jewelry of bottles, twice by mirrors, fanned behind a downtown lounge in Minneapolis. I understood a verse from Crane's The Wine Menagerie without intending it. The meaning simply came like that, like one of God's gratuities that come before we are prepared. Of all I ever worked to learn, those things are best that came to me without my earning them. I should have said without deserving them. In Minneapolis, a deeper thinker surely would have called all truth a gift, but it was hot and I forgot. <laughs> Later, when students let me tell them what I knew, I saw that all we keep of truth is what we give away, that holocausts can sleep like revolutions in the smallest flints, that any river any river can reflect the sun. I have a student's fear that truth is fun to seek, but death to keep. Heroes and saints are those who freed the thoughts of God by pen or tongue and made them last like Parthenons. I bleed the lambs of glory for those few who said that time must wait their christening. Once within their presence, words take flesh, and God wakes fires that can rock the skull and blaze the eye with revelation. A much more cynical poem called To a Commencement of Scoundrels. This happened at the time at the university when the faculty was against the administration, the administration was against the faculty, and the students were against both. My boys, we lied to you. The world, by definition, stinks of Cain, no matter what your teachers told you. Heroes and the fools of God may rise like accidental green on gray Saharas, but the sand stays smotheringly near. Deny me if you can. Already you are turning into personnel, manpower, figures on a list of voters, earners, prayers, soldiers, payers, sums of population tamed with forms, last name, middle name, first name, telephone, home address, age, hobbies, experience. Tell them the truth. Your name is Legion. You are aged a million. Say you breathe between appointments, first day, last day. The rest is no one's business. Boys, the time is prime for prophecy. Books break down their bookends, paintings burst their frames. The world is more than reason's peanut. Homer sang it real, Goya painted it, and Shakespeare staged it for the pelting rinds of every groundling of the globe. So wake up! Tonight, the lions hunt in Kenya. They can eat a man. Rockets are spearing through the sky. They can blast a man to nothing. Rumors prowl like rebellions. They can knife a man. No one survives for long, my boys. Flesh is always in season. 
lusted after, gunned, grenaded, tabulated through machines, incinerated, beaten to applause, anesthetized, autopsied, mourned. The blood of Troy beats on in Goya's paintings and the truce of Lear. Reason yourselves to that, my buckaroos, before you rage for God, country, and cis bomba. You won't, of course. Your schooling left you trained to serve like cocksure Paul before God's lightning smashed him from his saddle. So I wish you what I wish myself. Hard questions and the night to answer them, the grace of disappointment and the right to seem the fool for justice. That's enough. Cowards, cowards might ask for more. Heroes have died for less. I'd like to say a few poems about women. Uh, the stronger gender. It's taken me 90 years to discover that. What I'm referring to is the capacity, more in women than in men, of sacrificing for those they love with no hope of reward or recognition or any expectation of thanks. As long as the one they love or the ones they love get the benefit, that's all they want. That's all they want. I was reading just about a year ago a biography of Abraham Lincoln. Tom Lincoln and Nancy Hanks Lincoln, his parents, both illiterate farmers in Indiana, two children, Sarah and Abraham. Nancy Hanks died of a milk disease when Abraham Lincoln was eight years old. His father, Tom Lincoln, had to find some, he was a farmer, he was away from the house all the time, and he had to find somebody to raise these children. So he went back to Kentucky. There was a woman there named Sarah Johnson, three children, a widow. He proposed to her, she accepted. He brought her back to Indiana, and she came to love Abraham Lincoln more as, or as much as her own children. She taught him how to read and write. She gave him the King James Version of the Bible, Pilgrim's Progress, Aesop's Fables. Lincoln could never have been elected to Congress if it hadn't been for Sarah Johnson. He could never have been the president. And if he weren't the president, this country wouldn't be this country now. All because of one woman. How many of you knew her name before I said it? And believe me, that would be the way she would want it. I mean, have you ever seen a genuine woman who loves to do something for some particular person, or as I said, could be for her family, and somebody says, oh, you're a great mother, says, oh, stop it. If they accept praise, they're embarrassed. They didn't do it for praise. Love doesn't want any reward except itself. That's it. The bodies of women. Some say they just reflect the nightly love of the sea and the moon. But life and physiology have never rhymed. Think of the squat queen who tranced Mark Anthony and Caesar with her glances to become all Egypt to them both. Or dancers who have spines like spears and walk as if mere walking were a dance 
or nurses in their white, sure, soft shoes, nimble as prancers in motion and just as self-possessed. Such poise and prowess is the stuff of mystery. And mystery it is. What else but mystery imbues a woman of stature to subdue a mob with nothing but a stance or a stare? Or tells why men or countrymen can languish with their goddess gone? Learning of Piaf's death, Cocteau decided not to live. For what? For a lifelong waif whose voice was France for half a century. And what of M. Karsum, who stilled the Arab world each time she sang and drew four million, four million to her funeral? And what of Marilyn Monroe, whose public grows and grows? Is this bewitchery? Or is it something that will never have a name? Or does it simply mean that women live within their bodies to the end and past the end? Not so for men, who seem to leave their bodies as they age, treating what was once uh, an instrument as now a thing of no or little use. For those whose destination is themselves, what are such failings but a nuisance, not a destiny, compared to love or happiness or, or children? They appear at best as vanities. See for yourselves. The eyes of any woman say it takes more bravery to be and bear than to beget, or finally just be, with no defenses, no illusions, no regrets. A toast for the likes of two. If women had mustaches, they would somehow make them beautiful. Look what they've done with breasts. Who disagrees? Doesn't the Bible say a woman just an inch from death will keep an eye for color? And don't philosophers conclude that women sacrifice the ultimate on beauty's altar or loves? Why scoff at that? Are the male gods of money, fame, and power more deserving? What's money but guilt? What's fame but knowing people you will never know will know your name? What's power but pride translated into force? Are these worth more than what preserves us to the end? Consider Bertha, 80, blind and diabetic. She believed that death's real name was Harold. I want to know what Harold has to offer, she would say. She'd seen her children's children's children and believed she had a poet's right to give a name to death, if so she chose. So laughing, she rocked and waited for this last adventure in her life. And then there was Jane, who mothered seven and left unfinished all her art by choice, as if to prove that incompleteness is the rule of life, where nothing ends the way it should, or when. Two weeks before her funeral, she called all seven to her bed to say, I hope to see you all again.
but not right away. So here's to the honor of Bertha, and here's to the glory of Jane. May they be spoken of wherever beauty's lovers gather to applaud the beauty of love. May they not rest in peace, but thrive in everlasting action, doing what they love the most. Who wants a heaven that's equivalent to one long sleep? Those cryptid supine saints in their basilicas can keep the dream of their Jerusalem. The soul was meant for more than that. Pray for us, Saint Bertha. Pray for us, Saint Jane. I don't want to take your time. Can you take a couple more poems? This, called, this is called One-Liners or Less. What made Elizabeth say, I'm not attractive to men? Or Patty claim, my brother is so good he's boring. Or Dolores in her 80s say, I want more birthdays, but I don't want to celebrate them. Or Barbara, once divorced, say, the world is run by couples. Such frankness in some women makes the truth less fearsome if admitted when faced. And there's a lighter side as well. Watching his wife peruse the mail in her underwear, he said, suppose a strange man walked in here Without pausing to look up, she said, you are a strange man. <laughs> After the party crasher insulted his French hostess by saying, your meal was fit for a pig, she smiled a Parisian smile and said, so glad you felt at home. <laughs> but La Monroe surpassed them all. Asked if she had something on when Joe DiMaggio proposed, she answered with grave seriousness, the radio. <laughs> the shorter the phrase, the keener the wit. The keener the wit, the surer the touch. The surer the touch, the purer the art that knows when one word more would be a word too much. Dana correctly said, there's a dearth of conjugal poems. Uh, and with your permission, I'd like to say two and then conclude with a final poem. Is that all right? Yes. All right. This, I have to give you a preface to this. Uh, the poem is called, The Less Said, The Truer. And the epigraph is an Arab proverb Love comes to a man through the eye, to a woman through the ear. Well, my wife and I knew a young girl. Uh, she was a junior at Wheaton College, and her father later became the Secretary of Education in the Reagan administration, a wonderful girl. And while every one of her classmates was summering in Cape Cod or someplace like that, she applied to work in an orphanage in Tunisia. She arrives in Tunisia, a man meets her at the airport. Madame Marlon, we, oui. I'm here to drive you into the interior. They drove until dark, stopped at a hotel. There's one room. There are 28 men in that room. African rural hotel. Anyway, she stayed all summer, loved it, and applied to come back the subsequent summer and she met a young Frenchman there who was in the French equivalent of the Peace Corps and they fell in love and she wrote me and said, uh, Maurice is coming back with me to meet my parents and I'd like him to meet you and Marianne. I said, you're by all means. So I told Marianne, I said, 
Pamela is bringing her fiance to meet us. She said, oh, Sam, don't get excited. These summer romances happen with these girls, and they go up in flames, and they'll eventually marry people in their own strata. I said, well, he's coming to meet us. I don't want to meet him. He comes to the door with Pamela, tall, handsome Frenchman. Monsieur Hazo, yes, je suis Marie César. Comment allez-vous? Is it très bien? It's an honor for you to have me to your home. <laughs> so I went in, I said, Marianne, he wants. She comes in. Madame Hazo, how do you do? Pamela told me how much she loved you and Monsieur Hazo, and I thank you for having me in your home. She stood up and I asked her, what'd you think? I'd marry him if I had to live in a sewer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that got into this poem. When Cyrano proclaimed his love for Roxanne, he stood in the shadows. Seated on her balcony, she never even saw the man, but loved what she heard. There's more to this than mere romance. All those who say that love is based on age, height, religion, status, worth, or race are talking mergers, not marriage. The man a thoughtful woman allows to enter her body needs more than that to qualify. It's what she hears or sees in his eyes that matters to her. For lack of an alternative, call it the language of the heart. Bill's wife-to-be spoke only Japanese. He felt what she meant, and their 30 years together prove it a half foot taller than Faisal, Nuha left Syria to marry him because she liked the look in his eye. After Anne met Pamela's French fiance, she said, I'd marry him if I had to live in a sewer. Although her mother disapproved, Rebecca explained, I'm not marrying my mother. Twenty happy anniversaries later, she pleaded with guests, please be nice to my mother. What else but love explains why Trish mounted a Harley Davidson with Mark, who steered it after midnight in the rain from Pittsburgh to Washington with just one stop. In order to prevail, love challenges risk. Deny that at your peril. This poem is called The Ballad of the Old Lovers. Your body slowed down, my dearest dear. Your body's slowed down, my dearest. It's aging, I dear, just aging, I fear. Each year I keep growing older. The birds in the trees may never freeze, but the blood as you age grows colder. Remember the times when we used to play and hug on the sheets of the bed there? You'd touch me here and touch me here, and then we would wrestle together? Instead, we lie now like the dead there and listen all night to the weather. Remember the money we managed to save and planned to enjoy in our 60s? Well, 60 has come and 60 has gone. And what of our savings returned us but travel in season without a good reason and tropical sunlight that burned us? Remember the friends we knew, we knew, when we and our friends were younger. Where have they gone? And why don't they write? And why have the decades divided all those not alive 
from those who survive, no, ma no matter how well they're provided. But why blame our fears on the innocent years they're gone and beyond reliving? Since death's quite efficient, at times insufficient, is it asking too much? Is it asking too much to give us a chance to live till the end of the day and enjoy what the day can still give us? So give me a kiss, my dearest of dears, and sleep by my side forever. Let the years come and let the years go. We treasure what nothing can sever. In touch or apart is the same to the heart. Until death parts us not, we're together. And a final poem, a very simple epigraph What is the present but a future that the past made possible? We've come to the point of decision and the hands of the clock say, be careful. We've learned from the past that our choices are one or the other or neither. And the hands of the clock say, be careful. We've readied ourselves for the challenge of weighing the odds and the chances of what will result from our choices. And the hands of the clock say, be hopeful. We're not what we were when we started. And the hands of the clock say, it's over. Our yesterdays lengthen like shadows that fade when we no longer cast them. And the hands of the clock say, it's over. Despite what it brings to surprise us, we treasure each day in its passing, though we know that we pass as it passes. And the hands of the clock say, discover. We sit on the porch every evening, and the hands of the clock say, be watchful. We study the leaves in their turning from green to vermilion to purple, and the hands of the clock say, be watchful. While we stare at the sky in its vastness and name every star in the distance, we dwindle to scale in the balance. And the hands of the clock say, be grateful. The dead come to life in our dreaming. And the hands of the clock say, remember. The words of a prophet keep haunting the ones who ignored him when living. And the hands of the clock say, remember. The world that we think is around us is neither before nor behind us, but always within us within us, and the hands of the clock say forever. <laughs>